Hey everybody, it's Mike Delicio with another solo mode review. Today I'm going to be taking a look at The Magnificent from designers Elif Swenson and Christian A. Ostby and coming from Aporta Games. The Magnificent is a puzzly, tetromino piece game that's set in a magical world or a world of magic. Let's head over to the table. I'm going to show you the differences between the regular game and the solo game. Then we'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, here we have most of a solo game for the Magnificent setup. Uh, there's a couple of things that I haven't done yet just because I'm going to show you those as differences between the solo game and the multiplayer game. But the main thing I want to point out here is that I'm not going to be going into really any type of a rules explanation at all. If you want to get an idea for how the game plays, take a look at Tom's review of the game. I will link the uh, put the link for that video in the description of this video below. The main thing I want to do is just point out the differences, and there's really not a whole lot. There's, there's very little that's different between the multiplayer game and the solo game. So, first thing I'm going to point out is that you will have three hats kind of blocking space 6, space 10, and space 16 on the performance track. That just shows that throughout the whole game, those spaces are going to be blocked from you, and it's going to make it so that you have to kind of negotiate around those, and you're, to an extent, competing with them for the master cards and the trainer tiles at the end of the round. The other thing to point out is that the dice pool is going to be slightly different. You're going to have one of uh, each of the purple, green, and orange dice, and then two of the clear dice that you roll and put into the uh, pool. The other thing to point out, just because I want to, sh to make sure that it's clear, is that normally this first poster would be above my player board, but just in the interest of space to make sure everything gets on camera, I'm just sticking it down here for now. All right, so what finishes set up here is very simple. I'm going to be drawing six cards from the top of this uh, master card deck, and I'm going to keep four of them, shuffle the other two back. I'm going to take two trainer tiles off the top of the, of the uh, deck there, keep one, put the other one back. This is slightly different in the uh, multiplayer game, especially in your first games. There are cards that are uh, specific. You would look at your player board and get some starter cards. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I would look at these six cards and I would choose which ones I want to keep of these. Put the other two back. So let's say I wanted to keep this card and I wanted to keep this card and I wanted to keep this card and potentially Let's say I wanted to keep this card as well. All right, cards that give me a lot of manipulation of dice. And then I would normally shuffle these back. I'm just going to pop them under here. I take a couple of trainer tiles, pick which one I want to keep and which one I want to put back. Let's say I want to keep this one and the other one, again, would be shuffled normally. I'll just stick it down there at the bottom, okay? And that completes the setup for the solo game. It's no different, really, in a lot of ways than others. So. What changes in the gameplay? Again, it's very, very little. The one really big difference uh, that you can take advantage of if you're a solo player is you look at these poster cards, and if you want to add dice to that dice pool, you can discard once uh, per turn uh, at the beginning of your turn one card from the poster display to add a die of the corresponding color to the dice pool. So let's say I wanted to discard this purple poster card here. Okay, I can just put it in the discard, put out another one, and now I get an extra purple die and I roll it and it's a six even. That goes into that pool that now I could use to carry out my actions. And the actions are carried out exactly the same as in the multiplayer game. You still are either building by getting uh, the, the tetromino pieces to place into your player board here, or you are traveling to move one of the wagons around and collect gems and potentially collect these uh, tiles that you will place below your, uh, your posters. And so you'll, you'll either build or your travel, or you will actually perform trying to complete the, um, the posters and get corresponding bonuses and points, etc. You're going to play through three rounds just as you normally would in the multiplayer game. Really nothing else changes there. Uh, so 
The main difference is basically in your dice pool, being able to discard a poster card to add a die to the, uh, to add a die to the pool and having these blocked off. At the end of the round, the one thing that is different is that, let's say for example, I had been able to perform and I was able to get into this spot, okay? What you're gonna do at the end of the round is for every hat that's above you, that's not of your color, you're gonna remove the, from the top down, that combo between the, the master card and the trainer tile. So I have two hats above me, so these would get discarded, the top two would, and now I have to choose from those two. If I had been down here at the bottom, if I hadn't performed at all, then all three of the top, th uh, of the top three are gone and I'm left with what's at the bottom, all right? That's really the difference between the multiplayer game and the solo game. You're still playing the same game, you're still trying to maneuver that same puzzle. Now, to win the game, they say that you are shooting for a, uh, a high score of 200 or more points is considered a victory. And they say that if you go to 220 points or more, you call yourself Ringmaster, and 240 and more, you are simply magnificent. All right, well, that gives you a pretty good overview of the solo game uh, and how it differs from the multiplayer game. Let's head back over to the table and I'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, so there you see the main differences between the multiplayer game of The Magnificent and the solo game. Uh, as I stated in that little overview, I was not going into the rules of the game. Suffice to say that it's a puzzly type game where you are trying to gain resources and uh, put out some tetromino pieces that are gonna gain you more resources, more points, more abilities that you're all using to uh, fulfill these kind of uh, performances and get victory points. This is a victory point game, a puzzly type of game. But again, if you do wanna see more of a full rules overview, take a look at Tom's uh, review of the multiplayer game. First thing I like to do is talk about some solo benchmarks, things that are kind of common to solo gaming that I, that I tend to refer to. The first is a win-loss condition. Is there a automated opponent that you're going against? Is it a beat your high score variant? And in The Magnificent, this is a high score variant. Now, uh, oftentimes, uh, this can be something that is seen as a negative, but with this being a puzzle game, I think this is really the best way to handle the solo game. You're really just trying to grind out victory points. You're really trying to be as efficient as possible. Uh, they do a, put a couple of things in there to block you, to, to, to make things a little bit tighter. Your dice pool is, is a little bit different and having those differing, uh, different colored hats that block you on the performance track that you then have to account for when you're taking your master cards and, and trainer tiles at the end of the round. Uh, for this type of a solo game, I have no problem at all with the uh, beat your high score variant. They do put a little bit of a, a matrix on there saying that you wanna be above 200 points to gain a victory. So no issues with this type of a solo game having that high score variant. Set up and tear down. Now, I have to be upfront about this. The, the version of the Magnificent that I've been playing is the copy that's in the Dice Tower library. And as such, there are certain things that have made the setup and tear down um, go much more quickly. They're in little bit trays. And I would say that that's almost a necessity for this game that you really want to try to have little bit trays if you can, just because it's going to make it so much quicker. With those, the setup and teardown is very, very quick for a game of this type that has multiple, you know, types of puzzle pieces and such. Now, if you didn't have them and you just had them perhaps in baggies, it still wouldn't be outrageously long, but it is something you'd have to consider. It would maybe make it so that you want to make sure you've got you know, 10 minutes or so to set the game up. That may be on a little bit on the high end, but but with the bit trays, the uh, setup and teardown for a game of this uh, weight, which is, a, you know, a medium weight Euro game is very reasonable. The rules, the rules I found to be uh, very simple. Now, the solo rules, so to speak, are at the very end of the rule book in a small little section, and that's not a complaint. That's because you don't need more than that. There's very, very, very little different uh, between the solo game and the multiplayer game. Uh, there, there's a small adjustment to the setup, there's a small adjustment in the gameplay, and there's a small adjustment in the end of the round. But otherwise, you're playing the exact same game. Now, you don't have quite the same uh, interaction points, I guess, but there's not a whole lot of interaction points in the multiplayer game as well. So um, 
in the solo game, you're really just trying to be as efficient as possible, get those victory points, and uh, try to hit that that uh, threshold for, for a victory. So the rules are absolutely fine. They're brief, but that's because they don't need to be extensive. The other thing I like to talk about is art and components. And this is a situation where I really like the aesthetic of the game. Uh, I, I feel like it's a striking uh, aesthetic, and, and, I, and I, I feel that that helps evoke a little bit of theme. And boy, does it need help, because this is essentially a themeless game. This is really a game that, that with this theme, this magician theme, I was kind of hoping that that would be reflected more in the mechanics, but it's really just not. It, it, there, there's basically zero connection between the mechanics and the theme. Now, it helps then that the art is striking. However, I do need to point out that the board itself and many of the cards are very dark. And so depending on the type of room you're playing this in, you may have a little bit of difficulty in being able to see everything you need to see. Every, it's a very, very dark aesthetic. And while I appreciate that uh, from a artistic standpoint, from a usability standpoint, it is something that you do need to consider. You do need to keep in mind, it may perhaps be a problem for you if you are in a darker room or a dimly lit room. I would very, very much uh, hesitate to play this in a dark, darker or dimly lit room. So the art is nice, uh, but maybe usability takes a little bit of a hit. The other thing I did want to mention is that the player boards that I was using, as I said, this is a Dice Tower Library copy, have been laminated. Now, in the game that you get, uh, they're, they're not going to come laminated. And as such, it looked like these were quite thin. These were not necessarily cardboard. They were more paper stock. Uh, and, and to be clear, I'm playing the first edition copy of the game. I do believe they're going to be coming with a, with a later edition that may make some of these component uh, discussions obsolete. But for the copy that I have, the player board is, is a bit thin. The cardboard was fine. Uh, the, the, the trainer tiles were good. The wooden components were nice and chunky. No issues there. Uh, the cards I felt were of fine quality. So the only little ding I could give to this would be that perhaps if you have a first edition copy of the game like the library does, you may actually want to look into laminating those player boards just to keep them in good shape and, and not getting banged around in the box or on the table. All right, so the overall solo experience for uh, The Magnificent. Now, this is a puzzle game through and through. And as such, I think puzzly Euros uh, for me are a style of game that I do tend to enjoy. I do tend to enjoy efficiency games where you're trying to make the most of your turns and puzzle out the best of your turns without the concern of other people around the table to, that you're taking too long or they're taking too long. Uh, and so the magnificent fits into that uh, niche of games that I tend to like. So it already had a bit of a, of a leg up. I also liked the theme for the game, although as I said, the theme is tenuous at best. Uh, it, it's, it's really not reflected in the mechanics of the game at all. But overall, the game is one that I enjoy. Now, a couple of downsides that, that I already had mentioned is that there is no thematic connection. And so that bothers me a little bit. Um, the score threshold I also need to mention as well. I have to concede that perhaps it would take me 10 games or more to get anywhere close to that scoring threshold. Uh, as it is, I've not gotten very close to 200 points, which is the minimum considered for victory. Now, that being said, I'm sure that if I were to play the game over and over and over again, uh, I would be able to find those things that I need to work on, the things that maybe I had been uh, neglecting or not giving as much importance as I need to, maybe trying out some strategies that are not as readily apparent, not some of the most obvious strategies, which are the ones that I'm going to be going for in the first three, four games that I play of The Magnificent. So I do want to point out that, that for me anyway, the scoring threshold was very, very challenging uh, to reach, and I haven't reached the 200 point threshold as of yet. So that's something to keep in mind. I, I, I don't know if your mileage may vary. Perhaps you will be able to get the game out and within a game or two, you'll kind of crack the code and, and figure out how to do that. So um, that brings up an issue of replayability. Uh, I, I don't know that this is a game that I would come back to over and over and over again. I don't feel like each game that I played was tremendously different than the other game. 
to me, the biggest kind of area where you can examine uh, and, and explore different strategies are in those trainer tiles and being able to kind of utilize the special powers that are in those trainer tiles. That's where I found the greatest uh, decision space and design space, because otherwise you're really taking uh, essentially a couple of main actions. You're either going to be building those Tetronimo pieces uh, or you're going to be traveling with your wagons to gain resources and then using those resources to perform to kind of collect those uh, resources and points. The comboing is most likely through the use of these trainer tiles and perhaps the tiles that you put uh, below your posters. And so I think there is some, a fair amount of replayability, but it's not a game that I think that you'd be coming back to over and over and over again. And so that's something that I had to take into account for my final score as well. And that being said, let's discuss the final score. Uh, the, the Magnificent is a game that I found to be enjoyable. I enjoyed the aesthetic of it, although there were some perhaps usability issues. I really like the puzzle. It's a game that I don't know that I'm gonna be playing 25, 30 times, but I'm not done with it yet. I still feel like there's plenty there for me to explore. Uh, it's a game that I feel comfortable recommending as a strictly solo game. Uh, I'm gonna be giving it a 7.5 out of 10 and a seal of approval. Uh, especially if you are somebody that likes the, the, the puzzle aspect of solo gaming. I think this is one that really does do a good job of scratching that itch with some things to consider that may or may not work well for you that I've mentioned here so far. So there you have it. That's a magnificent. Thank you so much for your time as always and have a great day.